I want to give a quick story about our next speaker and how I came to find out about him. One of my mentors in the UK, uh, David Unwin, Dr. David Unwin, part of the public health collaboration, I'd say a sister organization to us. Uh, I was you know, bragging to him that I was doing fasted 5Ks and fasted 10Ks and, and he said, Tro, we have a primary doc out here and he's doing five marathons in five days fasted. And so uh, that's how I first came across Dr. Ian Lake. He's a primary care physician in the UK. He's lectured on type one. If you haven't seen his videos from the Public Health Collaboration, please go to YouTube and, and watch his talks. Um, he also uh, has 20 years of type one. So not only has he managed this in his clinic, he's also managed it in his life. And so I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Ian Lake to the stage. Thank you so much for coming from all the way from the UK. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you uh, for that introduction. Um, really pleased to be here, um, meet some old friends, um, and also lots of the people that I've been reading papers of and quoting papers, and they're here today, which is fantastic to meet everyone. So. Thank you for that introduction. I've actually had, I wish I'd had type 1 for 20 years. I've actually had it for 29 years. I was 20 years on the conventional lifestyle um, and nine years on a keto diet. And um, I can understand the reticence of fellow clinicians to, to wanting to get started with um, a ketogenic diet or even therapeutic, therapeutic nutrition for diabetes. I keep up to date in, uh, um, as a primary care physician on diabetes management in the conventional sense and there's nothing in any of our training over in the UK certainly about nutrition. It's all about the standard diet, the high carbohydrate, low f fat, m moderate protein diet. And I think it's got worse since 1983 when the problem started with the development of rapid acting insulins, and ActRapid was the fastest one then, and of course we think, well, that's really slow now, because modern insulins are designed for a high carbohydrate environment. And that seemed to coincide with the um, patenting of the insulin pen. So all of a sudden, people were freed up from the um, dietary restraints of having to take mixed insulin and having to eat several times a day to, to counter the different profiles of insulin. And it became total freedom for a, certain, a person with type 1 to eat when they wanted to eat. And unfortunately, I think that's been subverted to eat what you want. And, and we often hear, don't we, eat what you want and shoot up insulin to match your carbohydrates in the diet. So nine years ago, I was completely ignorant of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction. So I fully appreciate how it must be difficult for fellow clinicians to, to, to approach this problem. A lot of what I'm going to say will complement uh, what has just been, what Beth has just talked about, and I'm sure Belinda will complement the same, which is good, because running type one with a low carb or with therapeutic nutrition is actually not as difficult as you think it might be. It's actually pretty easy. It's definitely easier than managing metabolic disease because we've only got a single hormone to worry about. But it's how we work with that that is, that is the issue here. So bear with me just a second. Um, boom. This is the, um, what we need to understand. There are f roughly 40 million people in the world with type 1 and there are 40 million ways of managing it so it's personalized nutrition okay there are some good general principles as to how we might approach it everyone's different and everyone will choose from their experience and their knowledge as to how they want to manage type 1 diabetes i think the tragedy is um, that people aren't getting the information on the amazing benefits of a ketogenic lifestyle and and that's what i think we're here today, to do, and tomorrow. It's fantastic to have a whole day on type 1 diabetes. Um, so what are we measuring with this? Well, we're measuring stuff that's moving around the bloodstream, uh, if you see what I mean. Blood glucose is simply being measured, moving around from place to place. That's what we're measuring. We're not actually measuring what it does in the, at the cellular level, when we, we can't, pr practically. And similarly with insulin, insulin is moving around the system to act in distant places. That's the nature of it being a hormone. Um, and insulin is central to energy management. Insulin will get rid of sugar from the bloodstream, but insulin has far more roles than that. Um, 
and it moves glucose into cells, not just the, the, the muscle, the adipose, and the liver under the influence of glucose transport receptor 4, but there are several other glucose receptors that help, insulin, help glucose to get into cells and help insulin to manage that pass, more passively um, in, in that way. Um, insulin is an anabolic hormone. Ask any, any um, mother who had a, a baby with diabetes who's not well controlled, and they're huge. 10, 15 pound babies. Um, so it's an anabolic hormone and we need to learn how to manage it. Um, we have to manage excess fuel. Um, type 2 diabetes is a condition, isn't it, of excess fueling essentially and the body can't cope with it. And if we're fueling the body, we have to learn how insulin works with all of the fuels as sort of already been talked about and manage that appropriately. So what I think it's about is managing glucose through managing your insulin, okay? It's not manage, it is managing your diet, but you're actually learning how to manage insulin. So it's dead easy to do for anybody that wants to learn. You, you basically correct the basal dose, get the basal dose exactly right, and then you count your carbs, count your protein, and estimate and inject your insulin. That's for the food component. And, but you have to understand there are other factors to attend to other than food, and, and we'll go into that a bit in a second. Okay, so basically you, your basal insulin is the insulin that is needed to cover all those what we call background functions, metabolic maintenance, production of glucose um, from the muscles and the liver and probably the brain when you need it from breaking down glycogen, um, production of glucose de novo from, from proteins and, and, um, and, and some components of fat to produce sugar, the effects of cortisol on raising blood sugar and all of the other hormones, environmental factors, etc., that will raise our blood sugar. So insulin is required to bring our blood sugar into the normal range. So having talked about adjusting basal insulin, um, which is not difficult to do, and we may go into that a bit later on if you want, then you have to just count your carbohydrates. Oh, I don't know what's going on there, sorry. <laughs> uh, count your carbohydrates, inject bolus insulin to match your dietary carbs. So everybody with type 1 diabetes, and everybody who teaches type 1 diabetes will, will understand this. Get your basal right, count your carbs, inject the insulin. But the big thing is, if you're on very few carbs, you're on very little insulin. And if you're on high carbs, you're on high insulin. So typically, most people with type 1 diabetes will be on, say, 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. Um, and they will, if they've got a ratio of 1 to 10, which is a typical starting ratio, so 10 grams of carbohydrate will require one unit of insulin, they will then need, obviously, 30 units of insulin a day. And if you have a low-carbohydrate diet, you'll need far, far less insulin. And that will clearly lead to fewer risks of hypoglycemia because insulin drops blood sugar by around two and a half, but everyone's different. A child will probably drop, one unit will probably drop it by six or something or whatever. But insulin will drop blood sugar and clearly if you've got a poor estimation of your insulin and you're not correcting the, the, the uh, estimate the carbohydrates properly, you're going to get into trouble with, with more frequent hypos. So it's, it's well known amongst people with diabetes that a ketogenic diet will actually reduce your hypo frequency and to anybody with type 1 who has hypos that is very significant indeed. I've woken up a couple of times in the bad old days with ambulance personnel on the end of a glucagon needle and, and it's not much fun to be honest. So. We, I've been asked to talk a bit about time in range. Now, time in range is a relatively new concept based around um, CGMs, continuous glucose meters. Before that, we, we, we had finger prick tests and we weren't really doing enough finger prick tests to estimate the time in range. The reason time in range is thought to be more important is because the standard measure HbA1c, measuring the amount of sugar stuck to red blood cells, is not that reliable. And, it, and, and the average blood sugar, which the HbA1c measures, does not act adequately reflect the hypos and hypers, the low sugars and high sugar swings, which you saw a lot in Beth's previous talk and, and people who aren't that well controlled. So all it does is computes the time in the defined range. And for science purposes, the defined range is set at a relatively high level of blood sugar, 160, um, 160 I think in, in um, USA, um, 10 millimoles per liter in, in our country. That's quite high, I would argue, if you're trying to achieve normal glycemia and a normal HbA1c. That's the range they set it to. Um, 
It does have advantages over HbA1c for that reason, but it is just a tool for clinicians and says nothing about future predictions apart from the, the, how well controlled you are. But it says more about what's happened in the past, but it should be able to be used as a training tool. Okay, so I've got some um, pictures here just dragged off the internet. So this is for Libre, um, which is quite popular where I come from. And they, they, they can measure your percentage time in range, and something like 75% time in range is considered to be good control. Uh, and that's not difficult to do, really, if you're on a keto diet. Uh, and then they produce endless numbers of graphs for you. If you're really nerdy, this is playing right into your hands right now. So endless number of graphs as what time of day your glucose is raised, and then they can split the... Um, the, the, the centiles to say whether you're actually at more risk at certain times a day and, and how long you're spending in, say, the 95th centile of, of, of the blood glucose range. And so we come up with those sort of graphs. You can do as many, you can, anything you can think of, you can do a graph of a CGM. And, and that this is a classic one, the Libre view, uh, where you, you give the, the traces the average and then you've got 50% and 95% centiles around that. So that will tell you at what time of day. So this person here, say look at that bulge in the middle. So at um, around sort of middle of the day really, their blood sugar is a little bit higher than ideal. And then in the night time it's not too bad at all. And then you can plot that against the carbohydrate intake if your patients are really, really good and it inputs the amount of carbohydrate that they're taking as well. They're the little grain-like sort of um, dot yellow dots at the bottom. So and then you can make recommendations based around the profile. So perhaps you might think about changing the dose of insulin or modifying the amount of carbs or, or protein, whatever you're having. And if you're really, really indulgent, this is some um, trace from, from pumps and, and pumps just ecstasy for people who love this sort of thing. OK, so you get all of the same data. But I think the important thing here is this for me. This is the first time on all of those slides we've talked about insulin doses, okay? Um, now with this trace here, the, the, it's split into two time periods. Um, one was uh, sort of, this is the latest time period and that's the previous time period. And as you can see, you get a graph for each one and they're overlaid on each other. So what you can see is here that the pull trace here has now been shifted <laughs> a little bit to the left and, and, and but in an attempt to improve the control. And in fact, on this graph, people are using slightly less insulin here, 11 units this time compared with 12, and their statistics suggest that they're, they're, they're doing better with their average um, uh, blood sugar. So it is a training tool for people. It should be treated as a training tool, but it's best if you can actually, I mean, you will get results, but this is pretty good actually, because this person has an insulin carb ratio, which we're talking about, which is pretty good, 40, 40 to one, which is amazing if you think about it. So. I'll just move on here and just talk about type 1 diabetes is not protective against type 2 diabetes. We shouldn't confuse the two. Type 1 diabetes is a condition of um, lack of insulin, hypoinsulinemia. Okay? It's lack of insulin. The body cannot produce insulin, so we have to replace it as a hormone replacement therapy. Um, type 2 diabetes is a metabolic condition characterized by high insulin levels. Um, which can't control the blood glucose. Now, if you're injecting insulin, and, and Beth alluded to this earlier on, it's not physiological when it goes into the skin. I can't see a pancreas here. You know, it's in the wrong place. So what tends to happen in, in type 1s is that you need about twice as much insulin into your skin to work efficiently at the pancreatic liver level to control your blood sugar. So type 1s, because of the method we inject, whether you're on a fancy pump, whether you're on a hybrid loop, closed loop, whatever, you will be in relative hyperinsulinemia. So that means, doesn't it, that if you're taking insulin in higher volumes, you're more likely to develop the characteristics of type 2 diabetes, and it's therefore no surprise that people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes get the same type of complications, because it's probably caused more by hyperinsulinemia as well as high blood glucose as well. So, you know, how do we cut down the, the, the insulin? Start thinking about that, really. Um, so insulin plus carbs, as I said, gives hyperinsulinemia, gives type 2 diabetes. So you get type 1, and you will get type 2 later on if you're not that well controlled. So insulin 
has negative effects on health. It is life-saving. None of us with type 1 can do without it. It's a wonderful drug. But because of the way insulin works in a, in a, in a chronic way, uh, it, you know, over a long period of time, um, it can cause inflammation in the body. I think we have to think of insulin as something like electricity. You have to use it when you're, when you're making it. And when we're obviously injecting um, insulin synthetically, it lasts between what, half an hour and 30 hours. It's hanging around the system. Whereas somebody with, type, with, with a physiological uh, sort of insulin output, it will last between 4 and 15 minutes. So we're dealing with insulin that's hanging around the system a lot. And of course, if you've got too much electricity in your wires, they'll get hot. And, if you, and, and that's a bit of an analogy for insulin. You've got to work with insulin and use it up when you need it. So we've got to work out strategies for using insulin sympathetically, really. So what conditions can we mimic which are as near physiological as possible for the body? So the body isn't having to deal with too much insulin all the time. So there, there are strategies for that. Okay. Treat insulin with respect. As little as possible and as much as necessary is what I work to. Okay, it doesn't mean, uh, and, and the reason we're saying is as little as possible, um, obviously because of the hyperinsulinemic effects, but as much as you need. This isn't a challenge to get off insulin. Not one person with type 1 diabetes at the moment, we don't know, but it will not come off insulin. They, they need insulin for life, and it's not a race to see who can take the least insulin. That's not what it's all about. Post it on Twitter or whatever. It's getting as much insulin as you need. And we'll, we'll put some um, examples up in a minute. So because of that, I'm, post, I'm posting this. How does it matter to you how much insulin is used to achieve a smooth glyce uh, blood glucose profile? So that blood glucose profile sitting in those gray bars there, which are not that clear, but that's normal blood sugar. Does it matter how much insulin is being used based on what we've said? And I think it does. So does it matter if they use one unit? Does it matter if they use 10 units or 100 units or 1,000 units? And I think, you know, we, we, we are talking about managing blood glucose because gl blood glucose control is a good proxy for um, reducing complications. But I think insulin goes along with that. We have to learn how to manage insulin around blood sugar. I think that's quite key. So I've come up with this. Um, should we redefine diabetes as optimization of insulin more than optimization of glucose? So I think if we can optimize our insulin, the glucose will follow. That's my experience. So I split this up into pie chart, just drag that off um, Microsoft. But we should be thinking about sort of roots of health, pillars of health, the physical activity, our environment, the amount of food we take, and the amount of sleep we get, which all impact on, on um, insulin levels and diabetes. So food will have the biggest impact by far, but I think physical activity is a very good tool for ma manipulating blood sugar and, and reducing insulin volumes. So I'm getting in early here with the worst slide of the conference. Okay, if there's a, if there's a uh, competition for that, this is my entry. And what I'm trying to say is that it's, you, you shouldn't just split them all up. It's a good shorthand for thinking about that. But if you're, if you're looking at food and doing activity, the two will overlap. So, th so there's an overlap between all of these things. So what I want to do now really is talk about insulin profiles and how easy it is really to, to understand them. So, so that's a standard profile there. You've got, it obviously got some variability in the trace there. So there's something's going on. And what's going on? So that is called the dawn effect. Uh, that's early in the morning. Blood sugar's rising. Nobody's eaten a thing. Um, it's the fact of, of waking up. Cortisol wakes us up. Cortisol is a hormone that raises blood sugar, and that is the effect of, of that. So that is counteracted by some rapid-acting insulin, if you want to take rapid-acting insulin, um, because the basal insulin probably won't be that effective against that. And then... That's the effect of eating sugar. That's, that's carbohydrate, that's glucose tablets. So that's a, a different shape of profile, isn't it? A different gradient to the gradient we have from the previous one. That is the effect of basal insulin. That is a slow, relentless d decline of blood glucose with too much basal insulin, okay? That person needs to adjust their basal dose because they're, it's not causing a, a, a normal glucose profile, a flat trace. And, and then there's the basal working again after the um, 
uh, the, the glucose tablets uh, in, in the upswing gradient there have, have, done their, have had their effect. So insulin has predictable pharmacodynamics. There's nothing to be frightened of with insulin. It's just understanding how insulin works that will, will get you through this. So it's not dangerous in that sense. It's, it's not unpredictable. It can be made unpredictable when we get the wrong dose. That's where it becomes a problem. Hence, a low-carbohydrate diet will reduce the dose errors, which is what Richard Bernstein talked about all those years ago. So let's just look at this little pie chart here and, and look at food. So this is a questionnaire. It's not um, a questionnaire I did on 150 people from my website. How much less insulin are they taking on a keto diet compared with a high-carb diet? Now, bear in mind, these are all keto advocates. These are sort of ketofarians, really. They, they believe in the whole thing. Uh, but everybody reduced their insulin volumes. Some people, 20% uh, of people, 70% reduction in insulin volume based literally on changing their diet. So from the foregoing that insulin can be, um, it can be desirable to reduce the volumes of that, I think we, we can work on that pillar of health quite, quite well and it can be very effective in managing our diabetes overall. So not only will we get good glucose profiles, but we will also get... Um, get reduced insulin volumes, which I think is, is what we're looking for in this. So here's, um, this is my trace actually, this is an old Dexcom 3, which is before they linked to mobile phones. But I was doing a run from, I was trying to run the length of our country, um, which is not very big, <laughs> it's 6,000 miles or something. But I got uh, something like 700 miles, then I got a really bad knee injury, so I had to stop. But this is when I was somewhere up in Scotland, just started really, and I drink water most of the time, but I thought, oh, I had enough of this. So there's a pub, literally a pub, so I said, I'm going to have a Diet Coke, you know, just something to mix it up a bit. They didn't give me a Diet Coke, they gave me a full, full sugar Coke. So this is the effect of, of what happened. So an hour or two later, blood glucose, 288 milligrams per deciliter, quite high, I think you'd say. So what you've got to decide as, as, as a person with type 1, and this is what we have to do every single day, is to work out how you're going to crack that. You can just let it, let it go. Um, you could do. You could let it go if you wanted to, and it would eventually come back down again. Um, certainly, I was going to be doing a, a two-hour run after that because I had to get to my next uh, accommodation. Um, so that would bring it down, wouldn't it? But I decided to correct this, right? Okay, so how do you go about correcting a blood glucose that's that high? You can't just say ring your diabetes specialist because they might not be available. Um, so you just bear in mind that you need to work out something called insulin sensitivity index. So how much does one unit of insulin reduce your blood sugar by? Okay, so in this case, one unit of insulin will reduce it by 45 milligrams per deciliter, 2.5 millimoles per liter. So then you can just add up the, the numbers, the effect you want to have with this. So if, if you're running, do you want to go really low or do you want to stay a bit higher for safety? Um, it's up to you. Um, and then you have to decide how many units you're going to inject, okay? You could make a case for sending that person into hospital with a high blood sugar. They probably had some ketones as well, I don't know. I didn't measure them. Um, but you, you work out the dose, and then you can see, look, that you will get a reduction. Look how fast that happens. Wow, that's rapid-acting insulin, reducing the blood sugar rapidly over, over a period of an hour or so. So that's the, the gradient. Again, talking about gradients, that's the gradient of blood glucose that's rising as a result of carbohydrates, of, of glucose. That is the gradient again, because I had to take some rescue glucose tablets because it was a hypo. <laughs> and this is, a, this is somebody who's doing keto. Um, that is the uh, trace again of, um, of, of the sugar, of the effect of, of glucose. All the uh, gradients are pretty much the same. They're not complicated because it's not being complicated by what Beth said was insulin stacking, keep injecting insulin before the previous doses run out. That's when you can start to get complicated graphs. Okay, so, you know, all very predictable graphs for us, uh, all very predictable um, gradients for us. So we should now be starting to feel reasonably confident about how much insulin we're um, managed, managing to, to need to take. Hopefully you'll start to see that. So here's an interesting one. This is one of mine. So, um, okay, it's doing okay, but it, it went up, look, above six there, above, uh, well, it went up to eight or whatever that is, times 18, basically. Um, and what happened there? Because, look at this, no food was involved in the raising of this glucose. But you can see, can't you, look, there's a glucose raise there, and there's a glucose raise there. 
and then it came down again. There's no food involved and nor any insulin involved in this at all. And just showing you the gradients there, that's, that's um, sort of basal insulin kicking in really. <coughs> and it was coffee, okay? That's two coffees, one after the other, strong coffee. So coffee, the caffeine effect raises the, 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 the um, glucose levels by the effect of the caffeine as a stimulant um, on blood sugar. So something to bear in mind, we see coffee as zero carbs, but it's, it, it actually has chemicals which will, will have an effect for us. Here's another one which is quite an interesting one. I'm just giving you a few examples here. So this one um, was insulin resistance, okay? So we can see here the dawn effect, look, insulin, the blood glucose levels going up, okay? And then it plateaus out here, all right? So I normally take about 20 units total insulin a day, this is my sort of level, my age and stage. And during this period here, 20 more units went in and nothing at all happened to the blood sugar and it was good insulin there's nothing wrong with the insulin um, so that's interesting isn't it so insulin not working so that is acute insulin resistance the body's got other things to do rather than worry about bringing the blood sugar down i don't know what it was i don't know whether that was um, uh, too much protein or whatever but whatever was happening the blood glucose the, the insulin was not working on the blood glucose so leave it a few hours just to make sure that the previous glucose is out of your system. And then what happens at that arrow? Whoops, sorry. Whoops, hang on, I've screwed it up now. Um, so what happens at that arrow? I decided I'd use physical activity to bring down the blood sugar. So manipulating blood glucose by using other than insulin because the insulin wasn't effective. So this was a run, and look at the effect of the, of the glucose being hoovered up into the muscle. So we're sitting down here now, and we haven't got that lovely effect of physical activity working on our muscles to drag the glucose out of the bloodstream somewhere else. So we're relying on our liver to package any glucose we've had today into fat if it's in excess for us. But it clearly wasn't working here. Uh, wasn't working well enough, so you utilize another one of your pillars of health, your roots of health, to, to m maximize the, 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 um, the effect of the, or lack of effect of insulin here, but maximize all of your pillars of health that will bring down blood sugar. So it's not just about insulin, and I hope that demonstrates it pretty well. Uh, here's an interesting one. The run there was here. Okay, that's an interesting one, isn't it? So I put the blood sugar at really high, look. And this was a lack of insulin. This was where I hadn't put enough insulin in the body. And it had run out. So if I carried on doing that, I'd end up with a diabetic ketoacidosis. It wasn't dangerous because you've got a CGM to tell you. So what you do here is to inject insulin there and carry on running and it brings it down for you because you're using insulin. So I hope I'm starting to put across this idea that it's a tool, insulin's a tool, physical activity is a tool uh, to help us manage, our, manage our, our blood sugar. And here's another interesting one. This is, I don't know what caused that one, but this is a sudden dramatic, boom, straight at the bottom there at three. That's glucagon kicking in um, to save the hypo. And the only reason it could kick in to save the hypo is because the insulin levels were relatively low. So, you know, you can only produce so much of any hormone, your body's only got so much capacity to produce so much hormone. So because there wasn't that much insulin in the system, there was enough glucagon to, to counteract, glucagon raises blood sugar, there's enough glucagon to counteract that insulin and keep it pretty level so there's no risk of a hypo. So that, that is a fantastic advantage of, of therapeutic nutrition, low carbohydrate, ketogenic, in cutting your insulin volumes down and giving you that degree of safety. If you're on a high-carb diet injecting 30 units of insulin, you'd definitely have gone hypo that, that night, definitely. So this is why people on a ketogenic diet have fewer hypos. They, they're protecting themselves. They're making their bodies work as efficiently as possible, bearing in mind we're having to do hormone replacement therapy with a crucial hormone that involves all of our me metabolic functions. Okay, nearly finished. <coughs> so 
That one is, is, is the dawn effect again, which I showed you before. Just waking up, cortisol wakes you up, and, and that causes a rise in blood sugar. Best way to control that is just squirting a little bit of rapid-acting um, insulin to bring it back down again. So the, if that, that is nothing to do with eating. That is all to do with sleep. Okay. Um, so you, you, know, you have to learn how to manage insulin around all of these pillars of health. Okay. So this is an interesting one. So look here, we got ooh, this is going straight up. Blood sugar's way up now. Look, that's 160. Is that 180? 180. 180. So it went up, and one morning did a correction. It was even higher. <laughs> so, and then what happened the next day? Let's just have a look. Ooh, look, and the next day, very very high. Now. Normally, this is my trace, normally, as I say, this, um, I normally take 20 units of insulin a day. Uh, on day two and day three, I was taking 56 units of insulin a day. And this was COVID, okay? This is the effect of an inflama inflammatory condition on raising stress hormones and putting your sugar up and causing insulin resistance. So there's nothing I could do about keeping that, in, that blood glucose down. Because I was putting a huge amount of, sugar, of insulin in and nothing was happening to the sugar. Do you not inject insulin in that situation? I think you probably need it because you've got to counter the, the, the inflammation that it's going to raise the sugar even higher. But it, it's, it's getting the balance right, I think, there. And let's just go on. Day four, look at that one. Wow, that's, <laughs> that's a failed sensor. Okay, they're not infallible. Okay, you don't need to worry about that. As soon as it goes flat at the top at a, a really high number, you know, you know it's run out of steam. Then you recalibrate it, and then it's still re reasonably high, but then it keeps going off. So that's time to change the sensor, okay? And then if you look at day five, that is symptoms reduce, and hey presto, the insulin, um, it starts to work again, so the inflammation's all gone. So you can monitor infections with blood sugar alone if you want to, okay? And then day six, back to the normal uh, daily good control. Okay, so that's a good example of how your environment can affect your, your diabetes, and, and you have to work with that environment. In this case, you just have to sit, sit it out and get better um, and try to manage as best you can. But as soon as you get better, you're back to normal control. And finally, and then we can start on some questions, I'm sure you'll have some, hopefully. Um, I just want to talk about this, okay? When people go keto, um, this is again from the study I did of uh, 150 people who sent responses in. When people are on a high sugar diet, 57% of them had mental dullness. Okay, just like after Christmas dinner, sort of that sort of thing, you know, after a big meal in the afternoon. And 64% had visual symptoms. As the sh sugar surges up and down, it changes the refraction in the eye and people get blurred vision, etc. When they went keto, of that 57%, 78% reported reduction in mental dullness. And 51% report of those 64 re reported improvement in visual symptoms. Okay, so I think that's very significant. If you're driving a car, you're dulled out, would you want to hit that kid because um, you have poor glucose control? Would that kid want to be trusting you to actually be in charge of that car, etc., etc.? Um, so I think you have to see um, type 1 diabetes in the context of, of, of you know, the whole environment and, and how it is possible to, to do really, really well with therapeutic nutrition among, uh, above all and reduction in your insulin amounts to, to get good control and improve all of your symptoms. Nobody wants to even contemplate that situation, although that is happening around the world in 40 million people, if you see what I mean. And nobody really wants to, to, to contemplate it. So there's, there are numerous advantages for all of our people with type 1 to do well. And, and one of them is to improve their mental health as well. And we don't want any type 1 to be in the situation where they were legally allowed to accidentally have an accident um, which they couldn't, but th which they feel they may have been able to uh, change the outcome were they in a different mental state. 
And I mean, that's, that's dramatic, but if you see what I mean, it, it affects people with type 1 every day. We always have to think about these things. It, 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 it's not an easy condition to manage. But I think, I, or, or I hope, what I've done today is give you an introduction as to how you may approach management and how it's not that bad, how you can understand gradients of action of insulin, how you can understand how insulin works in inflammation, in physical activity, um, with food. And this is a start. I'm doing a couple more talks later, and then tomorrow we'll be um, talking a little bit more detail about, the, about how, how it all works from, from my learning of, of everything. So I'd like to invite questions, because I think there probably will be some, <laughs> hopefully. Great talk. Thank you again for coming. Trochalagian from New York. A uh, meta-analysis published <clears throat> this week uh, in Type 1 showed, and I'm going to quote here, a uh, meta-analysis of 351 patients showed that uh, good glycemic control was associated with uh, improved IQ and poor glycemic control was associated with worsening IQ. Um, and they broke it out to verbal memory concentration. Some of those subgroups weren't quite statistically significant, but all trending in the same way. Can you talk about the quality of life difference, sort of prior well, think, to keto and post keto? Yeah, um, I haven't seen that one, but everyone um, I know that is the gone keto feels a bit dialed in. You know, you just feel just that much more alert. And the the problem with being alert is that you don't realize you are alert until you, you are, if you see what I mean, because you, know, you live quite happily in this sort of fogged world, which is your normal and it's there every single day for you. Some days you feel a bit better than others. But it does have that profound effect on, on how, how much more clearly you can think, certainly in my case. And also it sort of chills you down a little bit, you've not got that edge on you. And I think what's happening in, in, a, in a ketogenic situation is that you're, you're allowing your body to dual fuel and, and we know and we'll be learning a lot this week this week that our brains like ketones and, and if you're on a high carbohydrate diet you're blocking fat burning and you're blocking ketones and that will have a del deleterious effect on neuronal tissue if, it, if it's struggling a bit so i think that you know would explain why you know diabetes is um is quite a tricky condition to manage yeah Hi, my name is Roxana. My son was diagnosed at the age of 8, 10, 13 years ago. And today, it's the first time I learned that his glucagon doesn't take effect because his insulin is too high. Yeah. So if he's on a, I just want to make sure I understood this correctly. If he were on a carb-restricted diet and he would go hypo, his glucagon would take effect and... Yeah, sometimes glucagon doesn't work, but, but mostly it's a volume issue, isn't it? It's how much you need to counteract the effect of, of, of the other hormone, and, and, and it's how much. So I, I would suggest that that seems very logical to me, that once you achieve near physiological state, you're more likely to be able to control all the hormones that uh, raise blood sugar as well. Thank it you. should Thanks. work. The other, the other thing is that some people, glucagon doesn't work very effectively. I know he's only eight, but just for example, spirit alcohol suppresses the effect of glucagon, so there may be other hormones that, that, that do that as well. So in that situation, glucose is quite a useful s substitute as well as glucagon. All right, thanks. I would go for both, yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Hi. 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 Hi, just a couple of uh, kind of comments and uh, perhaps a little bit nuanced, but uh, in Beth's earlier presentation, she said that language matters uh, strongly. And I look at our banner of Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, um, and I see that kind of reading in between the lines that it's becoming more than just low carb. And the um, uh, kind of with that context, seeing that 17 to 20 percent of type 1s are achieving an A1C better than 7.4, and that the time and range is defined as 70 to 180. And um, not many people are actually even meeting that currently. Uh, and that in the context of myself being a well-controlled type 1, eating a very low-carb, protein-focused diet, I'm 75% time in tight range, where I set my ranges between 70 and 110, because I am a driver. Yeah. Um, I, I just want 
to kind of look beyond just the leveraging of insulin and carbohydrate or glucose? And if you could kind of comment on a bit of the meta um, metabolism that changes with the ketogenic diet as far as kind of leading you towards like the usage of carbohydrate for energy, because I know you're using it, yeah. not only are the inputs smaller, but you're using your carbohydrate more efficiently, yeah. efficiently and, and fueling your endurance Thank sports, you. I'll be talking I think about, that's an important I'll be doing that later. Yeah, but thank you. Very, very important. Yeah. Hi. Uh, <laughs> woke me up. Uh, Alan Schaefer, Albany, New York. Uh, sleep medicine, pulmonary medicine, metabolic health. Um, and my comment isn't, or question isn't really about either of those, but it just, as I was sitting here, it occurred to me, um, the question was asked, or somebody said, somebody told me that my kid won't grow if they go low carb, whether they're diabetic or not. And... Um, that resonates with me. That's one of my fears, and I think a lot of people have that a priori fear before being told that it's just that they're not eating enough and not getting enough protein maybe. But is there a certain amount of insulin that uh, a growing child needs in order to uh, have normal growth and development? You know, you have your normal growth charts with children. I'm not a pediatrician, so I don't know I'm asking. I think, you're, I think so. Uh, other people in this room would be able to answer this question much better than me. But... Um, you know, insulin is an anabolic hormone, and, and um, you know, growth hormone actually suppresses the effect of insulin um, as well, so you're probably going to need more of it. But the key thing is with um, children, and I was reading a paper from Australia, I think it was, with four case histories about growth retardation in children with type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, read, reading it, it the, the relationship between the healthcare professionals and the parents has completely broken down and the parents were pretty well left to it. Um, and when someone's growing, they need a huge amount of energy. And I think it's hardwired into most of us not to eat too much fat. And I just wonder whether some families and some children don't just get enough physical energy in the form of calories to enable them to grow. Um, so I would always advocate we, we you know, do height and weight charts on our children very regularly, probably even three monthly in the growth spurt, and see if they're, they're maintaining their, their height and weight that they should achieve. And if they're not, you may need to be practical about it and just add carbs for a while to provide them with that energy that they need. Because we all know from when we were young, we used to eat loads and loads and loads when we were raid the fridge, basically, when we were in our <laughs> teens. So that, that was my take on it. If anybody else wants to contribute, because I'm not as expert as some people in the room. Yeah, absolutely, because, I mean, my question is when the parent asks you that, I say, well, as long as Johnny is, or Jordan, right, is getting X number of units of insulin per day, sure. that's the average requirement to yeah, prevent... Yeah, absolutely, but you'll, you can't, I don't think you can say the number of units, but you'll say, you know, you'll notice that the blood glucose is less well controlled if the insulin's in, in, in deficit, so you'll be able to work it through that as well. Julian. Hi, Dorian. Uh, Dorian with Keto Dorian, Mojo. Yeah. Uh, I got a question on time and range. Uh, it was showing there at 70 to 180. How do you feel about that as being some arbitrary kind of time and range? Should somebody on a maybe a low carb ketogenic diet consider a different time and range? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think we should be considering physiological levels. Um, that's what you said right at the start. Everyone's entitled to a normal blood sugar. Oh, right. definitely, we should be in physiological glucose, absolutely. But, but it's, like, it's like type 2 diabetes, isn't it? We, we define pre-diabetes and diabetes as an arbitrary number. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that really, it's just because the glucose is spilling over into the, into the, it's not being handled, and it's probably going to the urine, but we don't measure that very much anymore. And, and equally, we, we define low carb as 150 grams. Well, that was the level which was considered absolutely necessary for the brain um, because the brain uses about 500 calories of energy a day so that equated to and, and they assumed it needed glucose exclusively and they assumed also that you had to eat that glucose in order to fuel the brain um, so a lot of numbers are based around sort of scientific sort of standardization so we can compare and contrast around it but absolutely head, head for normal glycemia every time and so what are you targeting with that are you going for 83 Two, three and a half and seven yeah. yeah, about 80%, 75%, 80% around that range. I think that would be more than reasonable. Yeah. Eric Westman, Durham, North Carolina. Hi, Dr. Lake. Hi. <laughs> I saw your 
exercise internet uh, information and helped you put that into a paper. Well, asked you to, so thank you for doing that. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm halfway through Gary Taubes' new book on diabetes, the history of diabetes. I think it's well worth everyone here to look at it. I'm at the part where all of the standard practices about dietary treatment and insulin treatment were made without regard of type 1 or type 2. Nobody knew yeah. what the insulin level was. Yeah. And so I'm listening to these barriers and, and, now, and now I'm thinking, doctors who are taught about type 1 and I'm, this is Dr. Leonard said, so I, I want to talk to real pediatric endocrinologists about this because the fear of fat goes way back way before even the fear of fat in the obesity right. world. Right. And so, anyway, I, I, the book is, am, is amazing, and this is um, very relevant to learn from what happened before because so much had changed. And so one thing that occurred to me is reading the history, these children with type 1 who, well, actually some were, were older, when they were put on insulin, very small amounts, yeah. They started to grow, yeah. so so when you're when you're worried about well how much insulin do you need, you look back. It didn't take much mm. for for people to have normalization of blood sugars and then like growing inches of, mm. of mm. Uh, growth like that. Have you read Gary's book yet? No, I haven't. No. Well, I know it's up, but it's been out a week. Yeah, <laughs> so it's been out a week. Thank you. <laughs> I haven't had time. <laughs> Uh, well, and thank, so now, thank you for that comment. Yeah. Oh, how much of your practice is devoted to type one diabetes now? Very little, because in in the UK, um, I, I I do a lot of the sort of voluntary work and see people sort of as, as a mentor more than anything on uh, privately. But in in the National Health Service in the UK, it's considered a secondary care speciality, so very few people um, are getting this information. The, so that's just I, I I'm upset about and that. Me too. It's, um, it's, it's, well, yeah. I've helped a lot of people transition into obesity medicine mm. practices where mm. they were family doctors and, and they didn't have the tools to do that. Maybe you could start one day a week or and then another thing came to mind uh, where I think, you know, I, I used to talk a lot about Dr. Bernstein's mm. self uh, ex experiment. Basically, he reversed his renal failure, went yeah. back to become a doctor. Amazing. So everyone would listen and no one listened because when I talked to the doctors at the meet who went to the meetings, he said, oh, is Dr. Bernstein the guy who came and beat on the wall and said, <laughs> you're not listening. <laughs> so he needed a handler and thankfully the Dykeman family stepped yeah. up and helped bring all that information up. But it, I wonder what if doctors with type one or, or any or non-doctors or got together and did a case series of your experiences, uh, kind of like you can see now, like you can get publications yes. in certain journals. The Journal of Metabolic Health now is somewhat associated with SMHP. Yeah, yeah. But, so I'm just talking because there's no one behind me with another question. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that helped with, at a meeting like this <laughs> before, the McArdle disease, we yeah, changed the researchers and trench researchers by four people who came to this meeting, got up at lunch and said, you know, we don't know why we're better, but we have this rare glycogen storage disease and, and that's one of these side products of keto metabolism that you start running the muscles on fat. Yeah. You don't need sugar in the muscle like, like before. So uh, I, I think I mean, it's a great idea. I mean. Sorry, sorry to interject there. Well, but I would like to help in some way. Thank you, because we're trying to, what I'm trying to do is, uh, I'm running a residential course in the UK at the end of next month um, for keto conversion, basically. Um, and that and cries out for that with all the barriers, right? Yeah, so what we're trying so to do is collect as much data as we can, and I'd like to talk to people about what data they think we might collect that's useful, and input it from all the specialists around the world who are dealing with, and the, you know, who are dealing with low carb, ketogenic type one, and just get a database. It's not obviously, a randomized control trial or whatever, but it, it does give you an idea of what the potential is of this. And well, stay tuned for my morning talk tomorrow. Thank you. There ain't never going to be a randomized control trial. Absolutely. Um, I doubt there ever will impossible, be. Impossible, isn't it? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, well, I hope there will be, yeah. but I'm going to give the experience of 
the type two and mm. obesity and how mm. I'm, you know, and that weight. Mm. And then I see there are a couple of papers already published this last year. Mm. With so it's not so pessimistic. Anyway, me neither. Thank you. Okay, your turn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on one second. Hi. Let me interject just before. Sure. Uh, you know, we can continue to ask questions, but if you want to take a 10-minute break and just use the facilities, you can do so now. Uh, you can continue to ask questions, okay. but if you want to take a break, Thank you. just go right in. Thank you. So just, um, I had a, this, my name is Jill Litzinger again, and I'm from Missouri. Um, so I do have a type 1 son, and we did make the transition eight years ago to low carb. Um, so my, my comment is, if, uh, if you're, if you're doing protein and less carbohydrate, a lot of times the protein is very satiating. Yeah. So um, they won't want, they won't feel hungry. Mm. So you do need to make sure that you're giving them the adequate calories, like um, yeah. Beth said. Mm. So that's really important that you kind of mm. look at that. Mm. So that's my comment. And my question is, um, do you know of any um, studies that have been done that um, kind of, thank you that um, kind of uh, lay out what, what a rate of hyperinsulinemia is, like how many units um, in type 1 children is there, has there been any studies like that? that I'm, I'm not aware them? of any. Richard Burns, you mentioned 10 to 12 years before you start to get um, type 2 sort of hyperinsulinemia permanent effects. Okay. But I'm not aware of it. I think the only way you'd know is if people are abnormally gaining weight and taking more and more insulin. So As obesity would be... I haven't heard of any studies. Obesity yeah. would be kind of a... I think so, because the way, ins you know, because if you've got too much insulin, you've got to store your excess sugar as fat, haven't you, if you're not exercising. Okay. Yeah. And my, um, one more comment was, um, so we've talked a lot about growth in children, you know, and concerns about low carb and growth, but um, there's also concerns with uh, the standard diet. Um, when you have uh, hyper, you know, glycemia, that's also stunted growth. There, there's yeah, yeah. been documented yeah. growth problems yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that should also be brought to the fore. You know, there, there's a balance there that needs to be struck. I think so. that's interesting, isn't it? And also, obviously, um, women you. who are pregnant and have type one, you know, with hyperinsulinemia, there that you, you know babies do get growth uh, birth defects as well, which just attests to the the relative dangers of, of too much insulin. I think in growing tissue. Uh, I'm Ewan Feria from uh, Sterling, Virginia. I have a question to ask regarding type 1 diabetes people and elderly people. Um, maybe it's from autoimmune. Can you use ketone ester as an energy source and protein instead of just rely on insulin and glucose as the results? So what, what, sorry, what, what are you asking? Can you use For type exogenous ketones? Yeah, exogenous ketone. <clears throat> To keep up the weight is, and keep up with the um, an energy sources on these type 1 diabetes. And, and carry on the normal amount of Correct. sugar. Carry on the... Well, I, I think that possibly, but I can't think why you'd necessarily want to do that, if you see what I mean, because if you cut down your insulin, you're, you're freeing up fat burning. Yes. If it, so so you're, you've got your ketones, in, endogenous ketones. So... You know, I don't think you need to then supplement with exogenous ketones because you're, you're mimicking the, the conditions where you've got ketones for the brain anyway, but that does require lower levels of insulin. Otherwise, you're not going to free up the fat burning because insulin blocks fat burning. Mm. So you're never... It's difficult for people with type 1 to get into really deep ketosis because, you know, these relatively higher levels of insulin we're running on, you know, you're blocking the ability of the body to burn fat. So you have to be quite careful really and quite dedicated to the cause and from the studies I've done it's something like 75% of people with type 1 uh, who are keto they, their range is 0 0.5 to 1.5 so relatively low but it, it, it is in the nutritional ketosis range but it's never up there you know three four what some people are achieving so I, I mean you, you could do I'm sure you could but I can't really see why you'd want to but you could. Mm -hmm.